Hey, I'm Dr. Morales. I'm a board certified cardiologist as well as electrophysiologist and I've treated thousands of patients with atrial fibrillation. In this video, I'm going to discuss the Watchman procedure, which is an excellent alternative uh, option for stroke risk reduction for a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation. I'm going to discuss what it does, how it helps, as well as the procedure itself. So you can kind of help figure out if this is a good option for you as well. Uh, if you like this video, you want to check out more videos that I've made on atrial fibrillation, check out my page underneath this video here as well. Also click that subscribe button so you can get me up to date on the rest of my videos as well. So let's talk about atrial fibrillation as well as the watching procedure. I'm going to talk about stroke risk reduction. Why does AFib cause risk of stroke? Why medications are usually needed? And ultimately talk about the watching procedure and how it can be an excellent alternative for a lot of people who have atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is the most common heart arrhythmia worldwide affecting over 5 million people in the United States and over 30 million people across the globe and it significantly increases a person's risk of stroke. In general, somebody with uh, atrial fibrillation has a five times higher risk of stroke than people who do not have atrial fibrillation. But it can be very individualized. Not everybody has the same, same risk of stroke. Somebody who is younger uh, may have not as high a risk of stroke as somebody who is older or who has other health problems. The most common risk factor scoring system is called the CHADS VASC risk score that really helps your doctor decide what is your individual risk for stroke. So if you need to learn more about um, stroke risk reduction, uh, check out some links underneath the, this video if you want to understand a little bit more about how your individual risk of stroke partakes or affects your own treatment strategy. But why does atrial fibrillation increased risk of stroke. Well, atrial fibrillation, as I always tell people, comes from the atria, which are the top portions of a person's heart. The top portions of the patient's heart, instead of beating and contracting in unison like a normal heartbeat does, it's just kind of quivering. It's just going so fast and so erratic, it's not pumping that blood very well, and blood tends to become stagnant when people have atrial fibrillation. That can eventually lead to clots and then increase risk of stroke. But the main risk of stroke actually comes in a very specific area of the heart. In an area of the heart, and specifically in the left upper chamber of the heart, there's a little pocket in the left side of the heart called the appendage. It's kind of like a cul-de-sac, a little blind alley, a little pocket off to the left side of the heart. And that's where blood tends to become very stagnant when people are in atrial fibrillation. It just doesn't move, doesn't circulate as well in that pocket area. And that's where most blood clots form. Some studies in the past have noticed that over 90% of blood clots that form an atrial fibrillation are formed in that little pocket area right there called the left atrial appendix. So that's really where the main risk of stroke comes from. People get a blood clot that develops usually in that area, then it goes to the person's brain, it can lead to a risk of stroke. So how do you prevent that? How do you reduce that risk of having that blood clot inside, inside of your heart? For many, many years, the main treatment is with blood thinning medication. Blood thinning medication significantly reduces risk of blood clots in that area in the left atrial appendage and significantly reduces risk of stroke. In general, for most people with atrial fibrillation, the main treatment recommendation is going to be stronger blood thinning medication such as Eliquis or Xarelto were probably the most common ones used these days, but there's also other options as well. Other medications including Pradaxa or Cerveza can be options as well, as well as another medication called Warfarin, which has been a very long time. It's been around well over uh, 50 years. Uh, it's been around for a long time and it helps thin the blood so that you reduce risk of stroke. Back a long time ago, late 80s, early 90s, uh, there were some studies comparing Warfarin, which is a stronger blood thinner, comparing that to aspirin, which is a much lighter blood thinner. And back at those times, Warfarin consistently was rated better, consistently won on all those clinical trials to reduce risk of stroke compared to aspirin. So in general, stronger blood thinners are needed to reduce that risk of stroke for, for most people. And this has been known for a long time. And these newer blood thinners were studied together against warfarin uh, in many several clinical trials involving thousands of patients and showed that it was as effective as warfarin for reducing risk of stroke. All these stronger blood thinners reduced risk of stroke roughly about 60 to 70 percent based on the individual clinical trials. So they certainly are very good very beneficial for reducing the risk of stroke. However, you want to prevent a blood clot in that area of your heart, right? But it's a blood thinner that you take as a pill, it thins your blood everywhere, okay? So it doesn't just thin your blood in that one specific area. Uh, it can thin your blood everywhere and that can unfortunately increase bleeding risk. People as they get older and they have more health problems, they have a higher risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation, which is why they need blood thinning medications. 
but they also have a higher risk for bleeding as well. And so that is a little bit of a caveat with being on stronger blood thinners that the bleeding risk becomes higher as well. So people can either get simple bleeds like nosebleeds or significant bruising on, on their skin, or but you can also have major bleeding as well. So just bleeding in your stomach, bleeding in your stool, bleeding in your urine. Sometimes people can have a slow bleed that doesn't really become evident as bleed but then become very symptomatic such as dizziness, lightheadedness and you know that your blood counts are extremely low and that's usually because of a blood loss that has happened over a prolonged period of time, several weeks or several months. So blood loss can be significant for people who are on a stronger blood thinner. So it can be problematic to be on these strong blood thinning medications for some people. Now there are some people who take these strong blood thinning medications and they do great. They're on it for many years at a time, never have a bleeding problem. They do just fine with the medications. But many people do have bleeding issues and may not be able to tolerate those standard recommended blood thinning medication. But bleeding isn't the only problem as well. Sometimes there are injury problems. There's many people, especially as they get older, they have balance issues, they have fall issues, um, they're at risk for bleeding if they hurt themselves, uh, or even they've had a history of passing out as well. And so those also can increase your risk if you're on a very strong blood thinning medication, if you are prone to falls or have some balance problems. So these all make it very problematic to take very strong blood thinning medication in this particular patient setting. So what are the alternatives? Going back many years ago, you know, the options were either to take the strong blood thinning medication or don't take the blood strong blood thinning medication. And not taking the strong blood thinning medication increases risk of stroke. So taking a lighter blood thinner like an aspirin or even taking natural blood thinning medication, which is not as potent as even as an aspirin and certainly not as potent as a traditional blood thinning medication, increases risk for ha having a stroke. And so that was sort of that, the problem. You either take that blood thinners and maybe risk for bleeding, or you don't take the blood thinners and you have risk for stroke. But fortunately, there are options such as a watching procedure these days. Going back to the anatomy of why atrial fibrillation causes risk for stroke, that main area is that appendage area. And excluding that appendage area or sealing it off it's actually not a new concept. It's the idea of doing it in a minimally invasive way, which is a relatively new thing that uh, the Watchman and, uh, came out with when it was first approved by the FDA. The left atrial appendage has been excluded for a variety of years, but it was just a more invasive procedure. Um, the left atrial appendage can be excluded. It can be sewn down. It can be sutured. It can be clipped off from the outside surface of the heart. Um, that usually involved a bigger procedure. Um, that was traditionally usually done if people were getting heart surgery for another reason. Like if you were having a, a heart surgery, like a bypass surgery, where they open up your chest and they have to do bypass surgery, they may sew down that, that appendage area or they may kind of use a clip to sew it down from, from the outside. Or uh, if you're having a valve surgery. So usually it was in the setting of a more uh, open valve surgery is a way that it was previously kind of sewed off or excluded from, from the rest of the circulation. Uh, these days there are some people who still get it done uh, surgically. There can be, there are some more minimally invasive surgical options called an atrial clip where you can still sew it from the outside. But more commonly it's done in more in a, in a minimally invasive and a vascular way, which is what the Watchman does. In a Watchman procedure, a, a Watchman is basically a plug which goes into the left atrial appendage, which helps seal that area off and excludes it from the rest of the circulation. Uh, there's been studied in numerous clinical trials. There even has long-term follow-up for well over five years, showing that it's as effective as being on strong blood thinning medications such as Sorelto or Eliquis, looking at their clinical trials, and I'll put some links underneath the, this video, um, looking at their clinical trials, you know, there's the, the bleeding risk goes dramatically down when you're not on strong blood thinning medication. And overall, the risk of stroke is as effective as if you were on the stronger blood thinning medication. Nothing is a 100% protection for risk of stroke, but if you imagine it's equivalent to being on Eliquis in terms of stroke risk reduction, but without having all the bleeding risks. Let's talk about the procedure itself. The procedure itself, I usually do them under anesthesia, but there is increasing more to do it in more of a twilight sedation. Uh, there's a couple of ways in which it can be done. Uh, but just with the needle puncture, I get inside your main vein and your, and your left uh, uh, femoral vein, which is in the upper part of your leg, and take a catheter that goes up to your heart. Okay, In the area of your heart, you have that left up atrial appendage, which is right here in this, in this demo right here. 
take a catheter and cross over from the right area to the left ear, take a catheter over to this left atrial appendage. When I'm inside of that left atrial appendage, I can kind of figure out what size works best for you because there's actually five different sizes of this Watchman device. And we kind of make measurements inside, we make sure that we find the right one that is best for you. So when I'm happy with that, then I would actually deploy the Watchman itself. It comes collapsed inside of a catheter, but once I have it in position, I open it up and deploy it, and it kind of looks like this. It's like a plug inside of that left atrial appendage. Uh, there's a couple of tests that we have to do to kind of make sure that we're happy with the size, happy with the position before I release it and let it go. So in the end, this is how it gets left behind. All the catheters get removed, and that's, and that's it. Um, procedure itself typically takes less than an hour to do. Uh, you, you lay in bed for a few hours afterwards. Uh, these days that I make, the time when I'm making this video, most of my patients are going home the same same day of the procedure uh, after a few hours uh, of bed rest. Things that have changed with Watchmen over the years as more and more experience has happened since the original device was originally um, FDA approved many years ago, is that nowadays at the time of this um, video is being made, Immediately after the procedure, you do not have to take the strong blood thinning medication anymore. Uh, previously, when a Watchman first came out, um, they recommended to be on 45 days still of strong blood thinning medication like Warfarin or, or Eliquis or Zorelto, and then checking to make sure it's well sealed off, and then you don't need the strong blood thinning medication anymore. Uh, but now, after having a lot more data and having been around for so many more years, they, they have got new FDA approval just with about a few months ago, that immediately after the procedure, you don't need to be on the strong blood thinning medication anymore. Uh, you do still need some lighter blood thinning medications. Uh, they do recommend taking two light blood thinners, such as a baby aspirin, as well as another one called Plavix or Cupritigal, and that can be taken for about six months. After that, only the baby aspirin is all, is all you really need. And so it is really been a good benefit for, for a lot of patients to immediately to be able to take the stronger blood thinning uh, medication, take only lighter blood thinning medications afterwards. Overall, I've implanted almost 200 Watchmen. Uh, I think it's been a very good option for a lot of patients who cannot tolerate standard recommended blood thinning medications. Uh, it's a pros and cons. It has It's a procedure, so there's always some risks for procedures. But overall, risks for this procedure have been relatively low in my experience. Um, risks of, even nationwide, risks of bleeding, when you look at clinical studies, major problems like bleeding around the heart or major bleeding around the leg where it's entered or all less than 1%. Um, and I really haven't had any major problems uh, in any of the patients that I put in a Watchman in. I've done it on patients who are, you know, in their 60s all the way to in, in their 90s, okay? And so and then they all had legitimate medical reasons to not be on blood thinning medications. So, so if you are on blood thinning for atrial fibrillation and you've been recommended to do a Watchman procedure and you know you really have trouble tolerating a uh, a blood strong blood thinning medication such as you've had bleeding problems or maybe you're a fall risk certainly consider a watching procedure i think is an excellent option for a lot of patients for their atrial fibrillation i've done it many times in my patients uh, i'll do links underneath this video so you can learn learn more but take a look at it and i think it could be an excellent option for a lot of patients there are also alternatives as well there's other competitors coming with different products Watchman is the most well-known uh, it's been implanted the most uh, in patients across the world but there's other companies creating similar products as well there's another one there's another one called an amplancer which was recently fda approved uh, within the last year i believe and other companies are also working on their similar products as well so this whole concept of excluding the left atrial appendage is something that's going to continue to grow and grow and i think more and more patients are going to get it especially as more products become available and i'm really excited to see where the future goes because blood thinning medications are excellent they work well but a lot of people cannot tolerate it, and we needed to have good options for these patients i hope you enjoyed this video if you'd like to see more please check my channel Dr. AFib.